Welcome to part two of our course on demystifying the DODAF. In this part, we're going to be dealing with what is the DOD architecture framework. You recall that in part one, Steve introduced you to the concept of architectures and how they relate to system engineering. We are going to now build on that and talk about DODAF in that structure. One of the first questions you might have, though, is, first of all, what is a framework? Some people don't understand, and we thought that the DODAF would have defined this, but they don't. For some reason, they have chosen not to. So we had to go to the dictionary. A typical definition talks about a framework being a structure, something that supports a variety of other things, a skeletal support. It's a basis for whatever you're building. It's some sort of external work platform. It has a fundamental structure, and that can apply to a variety of things, obviously, not just buildings, but work uh, that is written. And it also has a variety of assumptions, concepts, values, and practices that provide some of that structure. All of these things are important, and this is a pretty good definition that we will tend to use. So we, I encourage you to, to adopt that one. So when we talk about the framework itself, DODAF, well, we can find it on a website. Unlike a lot of the previous versions of DODAF, this is the only place you really find it, unless you print it out, of course. The website itself, we have, you see the uh, hyperlink at the bottom of the page. Uh, it, it has a variety of things on here. It starts with the various tabs at the top that take you to a variety of other links that are fairly useful. Down the left-hand side, you'll see that there's a variety of indices that you point you at parts of the DODAF itself. And we'll walk through this during this session. We'll also uh, spend some time on those links later in part four. But uh, right now, we'll focus mostly on what is in the DODAF itself. In, in addition to that, it has some, uh, uh, some other hyperlinks in here that talk about the PDF version of the DODAF. You can download that and keep it on your computer. It's the very same thing. And one of the things you will notice is that the website itself has no page numbers, nor does the PDF version have page numbers. You have to actually look at the top of the PDF form to see what pages. Where possible, I have noted the PDF page that uh, includes illustrations or text from which I have drawn some of our comments. So you'll find that mostly on each of the pages, and in some cases in a hyperlink at the bottom of the screen. In addition to the PDF format, you can see that there is a uh, hyperlink to the changes that were made. This is a combination of all the changes since by, uh, the, the first version, of, uh, of, the, of the latest version, rather. And uh, so you can access that to find out the details on that. So in terms of the website itself, let's look at first at the background and find out what is the real purpose of DODAF. They define it here, and I've uh, captured that, since that's a little more difficult to read there in the highlighted section, I've captured that on another slide. You'll see that uh, in terms of what DODAF intended, it is an overarching comprehensive framework. The purpose of it is to have a conceptual model to facilitate that all the DOD managers at every level can have a fairly common approach and to managing information to make the key decisions that they've got to in terms of the principal uh, processes of the DOD. Now, in addition to that, it is principally aimed at those processes. There are six core processes. The first is probably the most important because here's where we're, the government uh, DOD specifically names their problems. They look at the capabilities they have, and in this joint capabilities integration and development system, they define what capabilities they might need to acquire or continue to support. Supporting that is the planning, programming, budgeting, and execution system, also known as PBBE. Uh, this is how they manage the resources to acquire or maintain all of our capabilities and infrastructure within the Department of Defense. To support both of those, when we need to acquire new capabilities, they have the defense acquisition system. All of this is founded on system engineering. In fact, in most of the regulations supporting the first three, they will require a fairly robust approach to system engineering. And that's the reason why we emphasize the fact that architecture really is part of that system engineering robustness. All of this is in support of the operations that we conduct in the Department of Defense, and that is a variety of regulations that support that. And finally, they're mandated, especially in the Quadrennial Defense Review, the QDR, uh, we need to have a much better management among the various portfolios associated with these capabilities. So all six of these are fairly key. The three principal ones are the, th the top three that I mentioned, the JSIDs, the DAS, and the PBBE. 
the joint uh, capabilities integration development system is uh, driven by the, the uh, Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff Instruction 3170.01. The Defense Acquisition Series is dri driven by the 5000 series of DOD directives. Uh, there is no single uh, directive or uh, set of rules applying to PBBE. It is a combination of a variety of things, but it also responds to the whole administrative division of the uh, U.S. government and the congressional uh, branch as well. I'm going to give you a little bit on each of the uh, principal regs here. The, the JSIDS 3170 is the principal thing that provides the streamlined process for developing these requirements that have capabilities. It talks about a capabilities based assessment that is a, a method of identifying what those are and what's needed. It also talks about how they're going to govern the architectures associated therewith. So right up front, 3170 is starting to require architectures. Uh, the CJSEI uh, 6212.01 is also something that's key. It helps implement 3170. It's talking primarily here about uh, interoperability information systems, obviously, and aligns with that and the net-centric operations and warfare reference model, fairly key thing that the Department of Defense uses. It defines how we do net-ready key par uh, parameters that are required as part of what you're addressing in your development of a system and certainly in the architecture itself. It also has some things, on, especially for information systems where we talk about information support plans and other fairly key documents that are part of what you're developing in an architecture. DOD uh, Directive 5001 describes how we actually manage the acquisition system itself. Management principles, policies and all that are required that we apply. And then 5000.2 is an instruction that tells how we're actually going to do it. So the policies in, in the directive and the instruction tells us how we're actually going to implement. In the instruction, we talk about a fairly uh, simplified approach, and this is aimed at all weapon systems, not just information systems, but weapon systems, services, and the automated information systems. It requires that we use joint concepts and, very significantly, integrated architectures to help analyze what we need to be doing in support of those uh, JSIDs defined capabilities. And it also specifies that the DOD enterprise architecture shall in, in, uh, underpin everything that's going on in information architectures. So the enterprise architecture here is something that we have to work within and that DODAF is a subset and compliant with the DOD enterprise architecture. So with all of that in mind, somebody might ask, well, what happens if I don't bother to develop an architecture? Well, the, the, the DODAV itself is fairly specific. It says you're expected to. Everybody, all DOD components are expected to conform. And that conformance has to do with supporting the, be able, the ability to reuse information in a variety of ways to support the decision making. This conformance is actually achieved when you have defined things in terms of the DOD uh, architecture framework meta model that has been defined as part of the DODAF 2.0. Also, when you set the data up that you're collecting in terms of that meta model, when you can e extract and export that information and exchange it through the physical exchange schema, then you are compliant. The real bottom line, though, is if you're not developing an architecture and not doing it in terms of DODAF, you will not be supporting these three principal processes. And as a result, you, the golden rule will probably apply. And in the Pentagon, that is basically that he who has the gold rules, and these are the places where that decisions are made about your resources. So your resources and your program is probably in jeopardy if you do not do one. So again, key principal ideas that we're talking about here are that the DOD architecture framework, the second version, is data centric. It's intended to support management decision making at all levels, but it also provides some flexibility for the process owners. And we'll talk about each of these points a little bit later. It's standardizing some of that uh, reporting in terms of the actual data you're collecting and how you manage to uh, store it. And what you're doing with this data is encouraging and enabling more comparisons among architectures, which is really the types of decisions that these high level decision makers are trying to make. Which programs do I continue? Which pro programs do I expand? And which do I cut?
A key part of all of this is setting things up so that you can actually align and provide information that supports each of the stakeholders that are in that decision-making uh, pantheon. So with that in mind, let's talk about DODAP itself. What's in it? There are two principal elements. There's a description of a, an example methodology, not required, but they're providing an example of how you might go about developing an architecture. And then there's an organizational structure. The organizational structure has at least two parts. One is the uh, DODAF meta model, which I will probably refer to as DM2 from now on, that facilitates the sharing of data. It's a structure that you really have to use as part of DODAF. And then there is a variety of ways to represent that data. There are 51 different models that you can choose from as a starting point. And these 51 are organized into eight different perspectives or viewpoints. And I'll be talking about each of these. Now, another thing to understand is what, is it do, what it, the DODAF does not do. First of all, it doesn't actually specify methodology. You get to pick how you want to develop your architecture. But they do provide an example. This is simply the reference that basically says, it's up to you how do you do it. They don't really require which of the views or the ways you represent data. Uh, they provide the 51 examples, but uh, you can choose your own, develop your own if you wish, or use these in various combinations. And finally, there really isn't a tool that they've chosen. You have a selection of tools. So there's a lot of flexibility here, once again, that the DODAF provides. What's described in terms of this methodology? Well, it's a six-step process. Once again, I've listed the, where you can find this in DODAF. Its six steps are fairly basic. You don't have to follow these exactly, but and I'd say that this particular one is a really high level. They provide a few more steps uh, within each of these steps here, but the information itself is fairly generalized, and you really do need to come up with a more detailed uh, approach. Now, Steve is going to talk about in part three how we, go, uh, we would do this in detail. Step one, you're talking about defining who are you really helping, stakeholders. Number two, uh, step two, what is the scope of your architecture? Both of these are decisions by the architecture uh, owner. That, in many cases, is the program manager if you're looking at a project. Uh, third, you're looking at how you do, what data, once again, defined by the project owner and the, uh, more often than not, the program manager. And then the architect, chief architect and the architecture team will do steps five and six where they actually collect the data and do the analysis associated therewith and ensure it gets into the, the data storage. And finally, you've got the documentation in many forms. Some of them are documents, some of them are tables, a variety of the views, and the, all of that is, in essence, what you're trying to end up with is a way to describe the architecture in ways that people can actually understand it. So you're determining the scope, the requirements, and then the architect is building the, the architecture. Now moving from this, I want to highlight the issue of scope. Uh, with the other steps we'll talk about in part three. But in terms of scope, the scope itself is a matter of taking a variety of perspectives we've talked about in terms of planning and the fence acquisition system. Uh, understanding what the objectives of the actual architecture owner is to start with and, and then responding to what the decision makers uh, need. The decision makers are shown in terms of the, the coot columns on the left and then what do they need is in terms of the level as shown here on the far right of that column. These are all parts of defining what are the various scopes we need to. So you have an encompassing scope and then you're narrowing it down for each of the stakeholders. But it's absolutely essential you understand who the customers are and what it is they need to ensure that you include that in your architecture. In terms of a general methodology, you take those all of that and describe that in terms of system engineering processes. Uh, Steve, again, will be talking about that in more detail in part three. But all the processes you uh, apply, including analyses, and from that you develop the data that you put into the DM2-based database. That really is your architecture. Steve yesterday referred to the database repository as opposed to simply the products or the views as being the architecture. All those views are really what you develop as a result of the database. You can pull out what you need. First of all, the architect owner pulls the models and selects from that. They may also provide their own version. And then from the database, they acquire the data, compile that into those models, and that gives you a view that is aimed at a particular stakeholder. You'll have a whole lot of these depending on the stakeholders you're, being aim, uh, you're aiming your information at.
So what does the organizational structure look like? We've talked about the meta model. The organizational structure itself in, in implies a, a lot of, of relationships. And first of all, DODAF, as I mentioned earlier, is part of the overall DOD enterprise architecture. That's the context in which the DODAF exists. There are a lot of other architectures developed by the individual services and the agencies shown along the bottom. And those are all in terms of the joint capability areas as shown in the middle. All of this is the structure in which you must develop your architecture. And the solution architectures come out the far right column. All of this is associated with the Zachman framework that Steve introduced in part one. You recall that this lays out a variety of relationships among first on the left side, details at the very bottom, all the way up to fairly general approach by in terms of scope and uh, strategic planning on the, on the planner side. And across the top, you'll see a variety of questions. And then in the middle, you'll see a variety of, of illustrations that respond to the intersection of both the planner or whatever user and the interrogative, as they call it, the questions at the top. Now at the bottom, you'll see that there are some examples of, of the specifics. DOTIF has taken that structure from the Zachman framework and overlaid it with the enterprise architecture structure. Recall that the enterprise architecture is the context in which the DODAF exists. The enterprise architecture emphasizes two levels, a strategic level, a capabilities level, and there are two architecture sets that are combined uh, as part of that. By overlaying that on top of the Zachman structure, you can see at what level each of those plus the solution architecture are most evident and the processes support those particular viewpoints. That you see that the, with the blue and the yellow, that the strategy and the capabilities tend to be toward the top, for the less detailed, but they're more aggregate views. And the solution architectures are mostly at the bottom, uh, associated with the development on the one hand, the architecture itself on the other. So this is part of the structure in which the DODAF exists. Taking these various perspectives in account, the DODAF has organized viewpoints to support the various needs of all these stakeholders. Many of these viewpoints have been borrowed from previous examples, continued, and some have been added. For those that are continued, we have the all view, short notation is AV, followed by a number indicating whichever view it is or model. And the all views tend to be aggregate summary documents. Also from the previous versions, operational viewpoint describing what your organization does, the rules associated in the interactions. Systems view captures the systems that support those operations. The standards view are the standards, the technology, or the operational aspects uh, that you have rules that you have to follow to meet the, the purpose. Services used to be part of systems and has been broken out separately. The data and information viewpoint is one also that used to be part of the operational viewpoint and the systems viewpoint. They have also been broken out separately. So they did exist, they've just been uh, aggregated separately now. New to this is the capabilities view. As you've seen, we've started to emphasize capabilities quite a bit. And then project viewpoint, because a lot of this is the association of the development of an architecture and system engineering in line with the project that you're running. All of these are necessary for meeting the variety of viewpoints and needs of the stakeholders. So what's all this talk about data? Why are we focusing on data now? And we have not necessarily done so in the, few, in the past. Well, in fact, we have in the past. There, were, there was a variety of methods that uh, DODAF was putting out before, but this is uh, a new effort that they're using. Uh, let me give you two terms that are going to help you understand some of this better. First of all, there is this combination of terms, taxonomy and ontology. Some people use them interchangeably, and they are really aren't the same. A taxonomy tends to be, in its most simple form, is a collection of standardized, defined terms or concepts. It's really a, a characterization and a categorization. On top of that, you have ontology, which takes that tox taxonomy and really lays out relationships among them. So that one is really part of the other. Now, in terms of the DODAF, uh, data meta model. Why do we have such a thing? Well, it establishes this, this constrained vocabulary, the, the, which are the taxonomy and the ontological approaches. It provides a specific semantics or meaning to those terms and a format in which to present them in terms of the uh, in enterprise architecture data required. 
It also has to encourage and support the discovery of this data in a variety of architectures and make sure that it's reasonably understandable across a, the variety of stakeholders that are necessary. And finally, it, it, they're aiming at a fairly precise uh, application of semantics down to mathematical precision, in fact. I'm going to discuss mostly the conceptual data model and the ontological relationships therein, too. Now, the, the ontological foundation for all of the DODAF is basically this diagram here. You'll find it within the DODAF. Uh, it starts with the definition of capability. So they define these terms. Capability is the first. Activity is defined as a way to implement a capability. The rules that constrain the activities. The project that you're using to actually deliver the activities and the resources associated therewith. They even go to the point where they break out uh, four different types of performers associated with the resources that are required to perform the activity. There are other things on here as well. In addition to that, they lay on top of that the interrogatives of the Zachman, so that you can see that the framework there is still used and applied. I'm going to show you several slides now that break out these. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. They're here for your reference, and you can use, pause, and access them at your own leisure. But they will define terms like activity. This is the taxonomy. The resources broken down into two types, material, information, on this page, and then performer, showing the various types there. And you note that a performer can be an organization. It can be a system that provides a function. It can be a person, an individual in a variety of roles, or it can actually be a service that conducts it, such as an application. In addition, the taxonomy defines capabilities and a variety of other things. Again, you read these at your leisure, and it goes down through skills. Each of these back goes back to that relationship chart that I showed you on the ontology as well. Now, just to show you how complicated this gets, and this starts getting beyond my level of interest, DODEF shows a relationship here in terms of defining things. This is how precise they're trying to be. For example, take the word thing. Thing can be represented by a specific instance of that, called an individual. That individual may be a type of a thing and is part of a bigger group. If you take that individual and type and combine them, it's what's called a couple, or it can also be called a tuple. Now we're starting to get some strange words, at least from a system engineering perspective. Let me give you an example. The individual, for example, might be the Roosevelt uh, aircraft carrier, and it is part of the type aircraft carrier. You take the two together, and that becomes a couple or a tuple. The whole point of all of this is this type of mathematical precision is not something that you're going to really put in front of the end user. It's not necessarily something that's going to most of the stakeholders, but it is a foundation upon which the, the searching, the comparisons, and the uh, relationships are established within the DM2 on the one hand and the federated uh, enterprise architecture on the other. Its principal purpose is to set that solid, precise mathematical foundation for the model. While the DM2 appears to be somewhat complicated, it is still very basic for your development of a worthwhile architecture. With that data, you are then going to make them available to the various stakeholders, and that's what the models are for. So what are these DODF described models? Well, first of all, remember that they are aimed at the decision makers, and as a result, you're going to have to be able to deal with a variety of representations. They are a way of taking that fairly abstract data in the complicated database. It's fairly complex, and you're providing that in a way that they can understand it. Because it's in the database itself, all the data basically should be coherent and consistent among itself. You then pull that information and put it in an understandable form for whomever the stakeholders might be. The way you're doing that is you're breaking it down into much more manageable pieces than you might see in the database itself. So what are the relationships among all these parts that we're talking about? I've used several terms, one of which was model. A model is the generalized description that DODAF has. You take the data from the database with that model, and that gives you a view. So a view is a populated model. You take a variety of these other views and, that you have developed, and you put them together, and that may be, if they are related, a viewpoint. And there are, as I mentioned, eight different viewpoints, the all viewpoint, capability viewpoint, and so on and so forth. These viewpoints can be combined 
You take all those together and you end up with a full architecture description. Now this is the architecture description. We get right down to it. Each of the views are an architecture description in and themselves. But you pull them together into the viewpoints and the viewpoints themselves as an architecture description. This is the compilation called the architecture description. So what is this architecture description? Well, it's categorized to facilitate a way to get at it in the enterprise architecture and then in DODAF. It's aligned so that you can actually map to it and link it to other types of architectures and terms. It encourages a way of cataloging the information. It gives you a way to actually move among the databases so that you can find what you need. And the searching aspects have to be fairly co consistent. It is something that is going to be described in the DOD Federation strategy once they actually write it. This is DOD 8510 is not yet published, but we'll come out describing how the Federation strategy will work, which is the aggregation of all these architectures within the Department of Defense. It shows an alignment between the, the independence, the flexibility, you're having minimum constraints as, uh, set up by DODAF, so that you have maximum flexibility to develop your architecture, and then you can also pick out the viewpoints that are necessary for your touch points within the, the processes that you're working. It also allows you to use uh, discovery through, first of all, the metadata registry system. We'll talk about that much later. And the architecture registry system where you're going to actually have to register your architecture so that it can be accessed by other people. And then uh, the assignment and the association of a variety of community of interest to make sure that those are integrated. This is all part of that federated approach. Once again, we end up with the viewpoints as a starting point for each of the views and models. Each one of these is broken down into a variety of, of views and models. And I've taken the liberty of pulling from DODEF2 a compilation of these. And so here on this first chart, you'll see that we have the all view at the top. There's two of those. You can see the model number, the model name, and the general description of what's going on in that particular view or model. Uh, they followed up by the capability of viewpoint and so on. You'll see there's several slides like that. Again, I'm not going to talk in detail about these. You can look at them at your leisure. Take up too much time right now to do so. So I encourage you to look at them and you'll see that there is a, a website uh, site as well for you to access these. In addition to laying out those capabilities in terms of a viewpoint, DODAF has also categorized them in terms of type. So down the left of this particular table, you'll see the various viewpoints laid out, capability, and so on and so forth. And across the top, you'll see a type of category for each of these views. For example, tabular, basically data that's arranged in some sort of row or column, often the numbers and texts. You'll have a structural type of view that is a diagram that shows how things relate. Behavior, talking about what the things do. Mapping that makes a linkage among some kind of relationship among some various data types. Something that talks about the actual taxonomy and ontology. Some pictorials, actually tends to be a cartoon type of illustration. And finally, some associated with timeline. I've listed on the next chart here all of these categories and given you the title, so you can look at these at your leisure as well. So what do these models look like? Well, you'd uh, like to access DODAF 2.0 and see them, but uh, DODAF tends to describe them in terms of a text. You'll find that uh, you've got very few graphics that you can access in DODAF when it comes to the actual models and the views. For example, the OV1 is a, what's called a high-level operational concept graphic. Its general description it, it follows, and then they'll give you a detailed description. So this is the format that DODAF uses to describe the, the views and the models. What they do recommend, if you want to see some examples, is go back to DODAF 1.0 and 1.5. I've shown you here the volume 2 of 1.5 that we'll be accessing, and I've pulled several illustrations from that so that you can see what each of those categories look like. For example, in terms of a tabular uh, viewpoint, we have the OV3, an operational resource flow description, and it lays out a series of categories and below each of those, uh, those types of information you would fill it in with data. This could be laid out in multiple rows. 
There's also the SV6, which looks similar, but the SV6 tends to look at the system that's actually supporting the operational viewpoint that we just showed you earlier. In addition, you may have uh, something like the technology forecast, where you take uh, types of activity down the left, and it shows how those will progress over the short, near, and the uh, up to long term. These are all tabular forms of illustration. Again, taking data from the database, from the DM2, and illustrating in a way that's a little bit more digestible for most of the decision makers. So what's a structural look like? Well, most of you are very familiar with a fairly hierarchical organizational structure. That is the principal one of an OV4. As a more detailed example, I pulled this out from other sources to show you that it can get quite detailed and show relationships and data flow as well as simply the hierarchical relationship. Here is an example using systems to show the relationship among systems that happen to be in various nodes. That is also a structural relationship type of illustration. In terms of behavior, you have the functional behavior. How do functions, subfunctions relate to each other? That's or this as a decomposition illustration. And you can take those same functions and show the relationship among them in terms of data flow and other types of interaction. These are behavioral types of illustrations. Here is the systems view of the same type of illustration. And also in terms, you may have sequencing of events, and this shows uh, from a typical event trace description how you might relate some of the things that were showing up on the previous two charts. In terms of mapping, more often than not what you're trying to show is a relationship among various items. For example, this shows down the left-hand side system 1 through 10, and across the top, same systems, and the dots show where they relate. System 6, for example, is related to system 2, system 3, and system 4 and five. You'll note that it also goes on beyond. Now that's just the generic view. Sometimes you're going to have a very simple view such as this where we take a system and show capabilities and operational activities in their interaction. And sometimes you'll have a much more detailed view where you're, again you're showing down uh, how things interact and a little bit more detail. All of these are the mapping type of illustration. In terms of taxonomy and ontology, most of you are familiar with glossaries and uh, dictionary of terms. That's at a very simple level of uh, describing things, but it's a relationship also that it has to be added, and that's what the AV2 will do when you look at it in a DODAF type of illustration. It's going to take every item that shows up in the text of your descriptions, and it will take also the icons, the connecting lines, the box, and the metadata associated with each. So the ontological representation in what's called an AV2 in a DODAF is much more complex than a simple glossary or uh, definition of terms. In addition to that, you might have relationships and terms defined in, in terms of something like a operational activity model in OV5. Again, a different representation, but it's still showing meaning and a relationship among terms, actions, and uh, others. The final two are a little easier. The OV1 is the only real pictorial model that's included in DODAF 2. Uh, this is an illustration taken from uh, at, at one of their briefings. Uh, again, it shows the whole approach to what you're developing is that your architecture will address and do, does it in a way that many people can uh, uh, understand fairly readily. Most decision makers tend to look at this one only. When it comes to uh, timeline, we have a few examples, but this is one of the better. When you look, look at timelines, you're trying to describe how are you modernizing your system. In some cases, you're going to be evolving it, adding in new functionality and new capabilities. Or in some cases, you may simply be uh, migrating from a more complex, maybe not very efficient uh, alignment of systems to a much more efficient and simple version, much more cost effective. So in addition to taking those individual views, DODAF has once again brought in the Zachman framework interrogatives you see across the top. They've taken the viewpoints that we talked about, the all view, the data information viewpoint, uh, viewpoints. Below that, they've listed the various models associated with each that actually describe or answer the question raised in the interrogative. And down below, they're showing the type of information that would actually be in the DM2 metamodel group. So this is part of the organizational structure and how they've brought all of that to bear. Now we've talked about DODAF, uh, 
as a fairly positive thing, but we do have some concerns. While it is required by DOD directive and a variety of law now, it only provides guidelines. and As a result, there's a little more flexibility sometimes than you need and can probably use. It really is a kind of the bottom, uh, the bottom line of a committee. It is the lowest common denominator of the activities among a variety of people. It attempts to blend all of these into a usable format. I'm not sure they always succeeded. It is a much more federated approach, which means the committee approach, as opposed to a fairly integrated top-town direction. But there's reasons for that. It's not well understood. It applies to all the DOD systems, as I mentioned earlier, but in fact it does seem uh, to have a fairly strong information systems bias. Yes, information systems are pretty much embedded in everything, but they're not the only thing. To the point where some people believe that the C4ISR, the Command Control Communication Computer Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance uh, nomenclature, should be expanded to include combat systems, make it a C5. Another factor about the understanding is that mo many people were looking as we evolved ODAF that in fact it would become more simple. This really hasn't been realized. They've attempted to make some things more simple, but in general they've made it uh, more complicated. And in that case, maybe a little harder for most people to understand. It's not really uniformly applied. As I mentioned, it's a federated approach, which means people have the option of applying aspects of it. And the reason why that is because most of the DOD agencies, the combatant commands, the services, have been resisting a lot of this top-down direction for a long time. So you end up with the committee approach that they can live with. All that notwithstanding, they are going to apply their own standards. One last thing that we are a little concerned about is the ownership lies right now with the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Network Information and Infrastructure. And II is actually being disestablished. Now there is a separate function, the, the Chief of NII is also known as the Chief Information Officer, that is by law, Claire Cohen, uh, and that function will re continue, but it will probably be reassigned to another person. So who really is going to own the DODAF and where, what's going to happen to it in the future? We'll talk a little bit about that when we get to part four. So in summary, we find that the DODAF is compliant with the Federal Enterprise Architecture and the DOD Enterprise Architecture Standards. It supports six core DOD processes, that is the JSEDs, the PBBE, the Defense Acquisition System, System Engineering, Operations Planning, and the capabilities Portfolio Management. It supports decision making at all levels. As a result, you've got to be able to provide the information in a variety of ways, and to do that, you have the data mo meta model that is the source of the information that you can then choose from a variety of, variety of models to reflect the information for those decision makers. We'll now be moving into part three. Steve's going to be talking to you about how you actually develop an architecture. Once again, a fairly high level approach, but it'll show you the structure that we often use here in developing the architectures that we've supported. When we get to part four, we'll talk a little bit more about other sources of information that'll help you understand the DODAF 2.0 better. <laughs>